Hello, everybody. Just like to introduce myself to you. I am Carlo, obviously, and these are some pictures of some activities that I like to do. So, I enjoy skiing, wakeboarding, mountain biking, dirt biking, and rock climbing. I like that rock climbing picture in particular. I had just broken my ankle, and I wanted to get a picture of me rock climbing with the fracture boot on, and so I climbed up uh, 20, 30 feet there and got the picture and sent the picture to my mom, and my mom was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> but you're thinking, hey, what does this adrenaline junkie guy know about data science and analytics? And the reason is, is that while I'm doing all of these activities, I'm constantly calculating in my mind, per that equation up there, how long am I going to live? Am I about to die? If I jump off that cliff, what are the odds that I might not make it? So I'm a very analytical guy. Don't worry, you'll just fly. <laughs> so if you get bored of my talk and you want to leave now, this is the brief overview of what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about better monitoring through analysis. We at SolarWinds write monitoring software. So we want to monitor software and hardway, hardware in the best way possible. And so we want those of you who are out there who are software developers writing the code that we're going to be monitoring to have a little one-up on us. And so we need you to help us out. And so that's what my talk is about, is about developing software in a way that's analytics driven. And the first time I gave this talk, I gave it internally to a set of SolarWinds architects, some super smart guys. And some of the words that I used, they did not understand. And they were all native English speakers. So I will not be offended if you take out your phone. So you can take out your phone now. And if you have to use Google to Google some of these uh, data science words, that's perfectly fine. Usually a speaker likes to see everybody's eyes and smiling faces. But if I see somebody down typing into their phone, then I know that I've succeeded at teaching you in new English words. So hopefully there's a couple of those tonight. All right, so what do we do at SolarWinds? So those of you not familiar with SolarWinds, we monitor things. We monitor software. We monitor databases. We monitor hardware. and we basically monitor the things that those of you in this community are writing. So what do we need from you is the ability to monitor that better. But a basic flow of what we do is we gather all of these numbers for the users that buy our software. We look at that data, and we trigger alerts, send emails to the people who are monitoring it, and then they get to do whatever they want to. What's missing is solving the people's actual problem. We monitor but we don't solve problems yet, and that's what I want to get to. So you as software developers, what do you do when there's a problem in production? Run away. Run away, yes. No, you look at big data that nobody knows what to do with. You just you know, throw buzzwords at it. Or whose mom calls them with random computer questions. And it's almost like the marketing people who are asking you questions like, why is the system down? Why doesn't the printer not work? I don't understand. So as soon as there's a problem in production, they call us, and we have to have an answer. And sometimes the questions don't make very much sense. So what do we do? We ask them questions. Well, when did the problem start? What did you do? What's changed? Is there something different in the environment? Can you reproduce the issue? Can you send me the logs? Can you run the diagnostic tool? These are all the questions that we typically ask, right? Because we need to find the solution to the problem. So hooray, they sent you the logs. You are the Google search of your logs. You get to search through the logs and find the exact phrase that points to the problem. I love this picture because it's a wood chipper. So you take logs into it, and you shove the logs in, and it chips them. So. We are all wood chippers at hearts because we get our logs, and we need to just wood chip away until we find that one little wood chip that is the problem of our system. So again, we gather data, we analyze data, we trigger alerts, and then the admin executes remediation actions. What's missing? Solving the problem. So some of you may have read some articles over time called Metrics Driven Development. That's where we instrument our code. Who 
logs their code, who has some sort of logging mechanism where when you write code, you, you output things to text files or to standard out or something. So everybody logs. Who uses performance counters or something in their code, you send out some performance counters as well. These are common things that we all do. We all have these methodologies. Why do we do it? We do it so that we can find problems eventually. But they're very inefficient. When you get the logs, you have to search through them. You have the performance counters, but you have no idea what's normal for that environment. So you need to instrument your code in a way that gives you better methodologies for understanding the performance, the health, and ultimately the troubleshooting of your system. Line graphs. So we all get the performance counters. We all get these numbers. And what do we do? We throw them on a chart so we can look at it. And but what does it mean? What does all that data mean? Well, now we need some algorithms to help us analyze the data so that we can make some sense out of what this data actually means. So what are we going to use? Let's start throwing some buzzwords. Let's do some random sampling. ETL, MapReduce. Google uses MapReduce. It must solve everything. So let's MapReduce. What does that even mean? Stream processing? The answer is data analytics. Data analytics is stuff that data scientists do. Super smart guys. I wouldn't count myself among them, despite what Lee thinks, but I, I try my best. But what is data analytics? Data analytics is the stuff that you learned in college. Right? You remember those classes. Who hated statistics in college? Everybody should raise their hand. We all hated <laughs> statistics in college, right? But you have these performance counters, and the challenge is, based off of those numbers that you're getting from your system, you need to understand what's normal and what's an anomaly. So I am proposing that we all start instrumenting our code differently, that we instrument our code in a way that makes these calculations for mean, standard deviation, median, skewness, kurtosis. Come on, skewness and kurtosis, everybody should be Googling. These are all the statistical numbers that we can use to help analyze our own performance counters that we already have. And in that way, we can have information in our software telling ourselves what's normal and what's not normal. Also, we all know that we live in a time-based society. We all live in a world where we go to work in the morning, typically, and go home in the evening. So you watch the systems that we use, and what happens? You get into work, and the network traffic goes up. The database usage goes up. Everything goes up at 8 AM. And everybody leaves 5 to 6 PM, and what happens to the systems? All the systems utilization goes down. So every hour of the week, those 168 hours, all have different statistics about them. So their normal Sunday at noon is different than the normal Wednesday at 5 PM. Those are going to be different statistics. So instrumenting our code in a way that we calculate the statistics for every hour of the week will tell us what's normal and what's an anomaly. And I keep hitting the wrong button. So here's a sample class that I've written in Go that will be on GitHub as soon as I get time to put it on GitHub. But uh, we'll update the InnovateSolarWinds.io website uh, with my GitHub repo as soon as I get it done. But here are the statistics that I'm proposing that we use. So you'll take this Go code if you write Go code, or I'll have a C Sharp version up as well. And you'll calculate all of these values for every hour of the day. And then you'll be able to know when there's a statistical anomaly. I'll also have classes up there that will be able to calculate what anomalies are. We have our data science team who helps me come up with great algorithms to know when something is wrong at a given hour of the day. So why those statistics? Why that class I just showed you? So we're going to learn a little bit of machine learning right now and define some of those words. Cardinality. So maybe you have uh, data performance counters that are low cardinality, meaning every time you read the value, it's 0 or it's 1. And it never changes. It's like your disk queue length or some I.O. It's always low. 
Then you have other numbers that are really high cardinality. They're always changing all of the time, like your CPU or other numbers that are always changing. So based off of those numbers, you need to make different decisions on algorithms that you use to analyze what is going to be best used to detect an anomaly. Skewness and kurtosis, those are the pictures off here to the <coughs> right-hand side. Skewness tells you out of your normal bell curve if your bell curve is shifted from one side to the other, which it typically is in monitoring software. And then the kurtosis is how narrow that bell curve is, if it's a flat bell curve or if it's a really spiked bell curve. So those two numbers tell us what kind of an analysis we're going to do on the numbers as they stream through. Standard deviation, you're probably all familiar with, mean and standard deviation. Median absolute deviation might be new to you, where you take the median of a set of numbers, take the difference of all of the numbers from the median, take the absolute value of that, and then find the median of all of those differences. And that's your median absolute uh, deviation, which allows you to run percentile calculations. Percentiles, in general, are more robust than uh, mean and standard deviation calculations. And then me, median versus mean, median again a percentile calculation, mean not. If you com compare your mean versus your median, then you end up with uh, knowledge of whether or not your data has strong outliers in it. And if it has strong outliers, it's better to use percentiles over mean and standard deviation. So this is basically the algorithm that we use in order to determine what type of analysis we're going to do on that data. So once you have those 168 hour buckets of your statistics, you're able to analyze your data and use those different comparisons in order to output anomalies. Ultimately, you want to know if something happens in your system at a specific time, then when did it happen? And then when you detect that anomaly, you'll maybe want to log something additional. So if something spiked out of control, all right, why did it spike out of control? You can then have logic within your code to say it spiked out of control because of too much data input <laughs> or the network was spiked or you can make decisions intelligently in your code based off of that. So Google came out with a wonderful paper called the Golden Metrics. And so we need to think about what we're measuring in our code differently than we usually do. Typically, we just make performance counters with no reason. But these need to change, and we actually have to have a reason for the performance counters that we have in our code. So we need to think of things in four different categories. One is latency. How long does an operation take? Because latency is king. How fast do you wait for a website to load? Probably 4.5 seconds, according to Google's research. If it's longer than that, you'll typically abandon the page. So operations have to be really fast. So latency is our number one thing to think about. So you want to measure your code, how fast it's executing. Traffic, how much it's getting used, that makes sense. How many requests per second are you getting in? If you've built a REST API, you want to track how, how much you're able to consume. Errors, of course, you're catching exceptions or you're doing other sort of error management within your code. You need to keep a counter of how many errors you're getting and then change that to a rate of how many errors per minute or how many errors per hour that you're getting. And then that rate can be analyzed statistically. And of course, saturation. How much are you actually able to handle and are you getting oversaturated? If you have a certain capacity of your system, you need to understand what that capacity is and if you're going too much. I've noted here in the uh, slide deck that there's other methods, the red method, the TSA, and the use method. A couple of those are by Brendan Gregg, a famous Netflix uh, monitor guru. Uh, encourage you to Google those and read those articles. Brendan Gregg is uh, the ace of uh, monitoring at Netflix. We also need to understand better the metrics in our system and how they're related. Often you'll end up with a problem that has a what's called a domino effect, where things just cascade and hit each other as things fall down. So ultimately, a disk queue length problem on your hard drive might ultimately might cause slow database queries, which then cause a slow website. So your user calls in and he says, I've got a slow website. <coughs> well, by knowing the relationships between the different 
metrics within your system, within the different performance counters, you're able to properly diagnose the problems so that it, you can understand the complexities of your system. So I'm also suggesting that we, as software developers, need to instrument our code in such a way that we define these relationships so that we know which performance counters are related to which other performance counters. Moreover, you don't want to waste CPU cycles, right? When you do logging, you log just at the error level for the most part. But then, when a problem happens, you tell the customer, all right, change the log level to debug, reproduce the error, and send me the logs. Same thing here. You don't want to waste CPU cycles on your thing calculating statistics that you don't necessarily need to use. So in this, you can have log levels like primary, secondary, and tertiary for your performance counters and only calculate those metrics and statistics that you care about that are your top level. But then when a problem arises, you can ask the customer, all right, turn on your tertiary statistical calculations. Then you start running all of the calculations, and then you'll be able to more accurately tell where the problem is within your code. Let's say you want to store something. So you're running all of these statistical calculations. You're following everything that I said like a good audience would. And but you still want to store something. Well, I would suggest that you store the 168 buckets of statistics. So as you're writing your code, you're instrumenting your code, you've got these 168 buckets of statistics for each hour of the week. Store those so that you're able to analyze that data. We've got a new data set. Instead of just looking at the individual performance counters, you now have a data set of statistics that can be analyzed and used for further analysis. For those of you familiar with Prometheus or other such software, they recommend that you have a slash metrics at the end of your API. So if you're developing a REST API or such similar things, have a slash metrics after your thing that you're able to then <coughs> query. Because again, we're SolarWinds. We're monitoring the software that you're writing. So we need a constant API to go ask for the metrics and the statistics. So just create a slash metrics at the end of your uh, REST API, and we will query that and be able to gather all of this valuable data. And then uh, slash metrics slash metric name will allow us to get the specific details about a specific metric that you have. So by following this uh, methodology, we'll have a consistent thing across the uh, industry of how we expose metrics and metric statistics across all of the software, which makes all of our systems easier to monitor and debug. So here's a sample that I did of uh, something that I was doing for some change point analysis software. I hit my REST API many times to see what was my duration of different uh, queries to my service. And lo and behold, I had uh, a few anomalies. Uh, you see my third quartile is zero, but my maximum is 147. So indeed, one of my operations took much longer than all of the rest of it, and it was indeed considered an anomaly. So we have to think about our metrics differently as well. Typically, if you write a queue, what's the performance counter that you're going to track on your queue? Queue length, right? Makes sense. But queue length isn't always the best indicator as to what, if any, there's a problem in your queue. Are you guaranteed that if your queue length gets longer, that that's a problem? Maybe not. But the duration <coughs> of how long items spend in your queue is a much better indicator of what's going on in your system. If the items are spending longer time in the queue, that's a problem versus how long the queue actually is. So ultimately, this system that I'm suggesting that we all start using gives us a better ability to do health checks. So in container land, for those of you who might be writing microservices using Kubernetes or Docker, these systems use health checks in order to check the container's health. And if the container's not healthy, then it kills that container and spawns a new one. With this methodology, you're able to quantify the health of a container, or you're able to quantify the health of a microservice to give it a numeric value. You're calculating those golden metrics. You know what the latency is. You know what the error count is. So you can give a quantifiable value to the health of your system. So a practical example. 
So we have the polling frequency. If you notice the latency of a certain device, don't poll at the default timeout. So if you're writing software and you're asking a device or you're asking a service for things again and again, and you're asking it every five seconds, but it takes six seconds to respond, you can now make an intelligent decision within your software. All right, this thing will take six seconds to respond, so maybe I'll just throttle myself and I'll ask every seven seconds instead of every five seconds, since I know it's not going to respond in time anyways. So you're able to have these more thoughtful decisions within your code because you're analyzing the performance counters and you have these statistics to make these decisions on. And lastly, you get to do <coughs> machine learning and use neural networks. Right? Everybody wants to do that. That's so hot right now because the last few um, conferences that I've attended, AWS reInvent, KubeCon, there was just tons and tons of machine learning and deep learning, and it's amazing what they're trying to do. But this sort of data, this sort of statistical analysis gives you the ability to do those sorts of algorithms where you can take as input these statistics and then be able to predict whether or not you're going to have alerts in the next hour. So we actually open the door by instead of just performing <laughs> performance counters, if we have these statistical analysis, we'll have a much better chance of being able to use machine learning to predict alerts and errors within our software. Do we need to store all of the data that we have in our system? I once heard a statistic that the amount of data that's being stored in databases today around the world is growing at the same rate as garbage in uh, dumps around the world. So we're collecting as much data as we are garbage. And how much of that data is actually used? Probably not all of it. And so we need to be more efficient at what we're storing. So instead of storing lots and lots and lots of twos, you can just store the statistical analysis. So again, the statistics speak more than just the raw data, because the raw data doesn't have any intelligence in it, whereas the statistics do. So in summary, prepare to be monitored. You are going to write software that somebody else is going to want to watch, and they're going to need to know what's going on. So instead of just doing your typical logging and performance counters, do some statistical analysis. Have that intelligence built into your software so that as people are monitoring it, they'll be able to have that intelligence and know what an actual anomaly is, what a problem is, and be able to make those decisions accurately and quickly. And you'll be able to even find errors faster <laughs> yourself, because you'll know that at 7.05 PM on Saturday night, there was a statistical anomaly in my code. Thank you.